All right. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Kevin Skinner. I hope uh, you're doing well. This is Dr. Kevin Skinner with Adult Recovery, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, one of the interesting uh, things uh, that technology allows us to do is actually do this all over the world. We've had participants with our webinars from all over the world, and so we want to thank you for joining us today. A little bit of background on me. Uh, I'm the clinical director here at Adult Recovery. I'm the author of uh, Treating Pornography Addiction, The Essential Tools for Recovery, and I've created uh, multiple audio CDs uh, working with couples who are dealing with pornography and sexual addiction in their lives. So uh, that's a little bit about me. I'm actually the father of eight children, and I have my uh, PhD from Brigham Young University as a licensed marriage and family therapist. This is a topic dealing with pornography and sexual addiction that I've been dealing with for many, many years. Uh, I first came to me when I was working at a local agency, and uh, I remember one day we had about uh, 11 people who had called up and uh, needed clinical services, therapy services, and seven of the 11 were actually dealing with pornography or another form of sexual addiction, something that is uh, quite significant, and I started wondering what is, what is actually going on? Why, why is this such a prevalent problem? That was 1997, and uh, since then I've... Uh, been dealing with so many different individuals and seen many different circumstances uh, where pornography and sexual addiction has, has changed people's lives and their relationships. So um, I began asking a question, and the question uh, started off as just uh, what happens with addiction and intimacy in the relationship? And so what I'm going to be sharing with you today uh, is research that I've been gathering over the past few years to address the difference uh, and how addiction influences intimacy in the relationship. My argument, uh, I will actually show you in a minute, that addiction is actually an intimacy problem. And uh, let me uh, go ahead and show you what I mean by that. Just one second if my computer will now move. There we go. So my objectives, these are the objectives that I have in the few minutes that we will be spending together today. First of all, introduction that I've already described came from a concept that I was wondering about. Can those two coexist, addiction and intimacy? I started with a three-page uh, write-up and it ended up being about a 50-page uh, discussion of, of those, uh, an article I titled Addiction and Intimacy. Uh, I'm also going to go over uh, what we call the Partner Sexual Survey. This was a survey written by Dr. Stephanie Carnes and we're going to go over some concepts of, of how uh, discovering a partner sexual uh, acting out influences the sexual relationship in many different ways and we're going to cover the 10 different uh, categories that Dr. Carnes has discovered and uh, we'll go over some of her assessment questions. Uh, then we're going to discuss how sexual addiction changes sexual intimacy and I have uh, literally I have hundreds and hundreds of individuals who have shared their experience with me on how sexual addiction has changed the sexual intimacy in the relationship. I will be sharing those statistics with you as we as we move through the the uh, today's discussion, I've got a couple of poll questions I'll invite you to participate in as well. Now, uh, the other part of it is I'm going to describe the in depth, the nuts and bolts of what sexual addiction, how it prevents uh, psychological intimacy, a form of intimacy that I believe is the crux of healthy relationships. And then we're going to close with the concept uh, addiction or intimacy illustrated this concept. And this picture is probably the one that I, I could identify the best uh, in terms of the just the overall what it looks and feels like in a relationship. You've got two people who don't know what to say one to another. They're really struggling to make sense of what does this mean for us? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for our relationship? How do we communicate about it? And when we get to the point of addiction, we get to the point where it's overwhelming uh, individuals and it's really hard for couples to truly try to understand each other. So what should he say? What should she say? Uh, can we talk about it? Can we not talk about it? And as you look at couples in recovery, I have discovered over the years that many couples really, really struggle knowing how to communicate about an individual's involvement in pornography or other sexual behaviors. And of course it makes it, this relationship that we really want to work out, has there's pain and hurt and both individuals are suffering and most couples really struggle to really connect. So I think this picture, these pictures actually illustrate this um, in, a, in a way that you can actually see it. Now, um, a couple of things about addiction and intimacy. 
I, I mentioned earlier, addiction is an intimacy problem. And what do I mean by that? Addiction is generally a lack of attachment, a lack of being close to the other person or even with yourself. So what addiction prevents is closeness. And in their partner, it creates fear. So it's hard to feel intimate and fear simultaneously. So that is why I believe addiction prevents intimacy. I actually have surveyed uh, literally thousands of men trapped and women trapped in the addiction. And what I often hear from them is that they're so focused on their own pain, they're trying to overcome it, their struggles, the secrecy of it, the hiding of it, that they feel like they cannot be authentic or real with the people with whom they would like to share their deepest intimacy. As a consequence, individuals grow up in families, and because of their family background, which is often the case, they never really develop deep, intimate relationships, and the addiction has been a coping mechanism that they've used over the years, and that addiction now prevents them from getting what they desire the most, which is intimacy. So I believe as we move toward intimacy, we move away from addiction. As we move toward addiction, we move away from intimacy. Number three, addiction creates relationship fractures. I can think of very few addictions where relationships are built. Alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, pornography, gambling, sex addiction, any of these addictions create relationship fractures. And the reason why they create relationship fractures are, are multiple, there's multiple reasons. One is it hurts the trust. The other is addiction becomes more intro-focused, in, internally focused. So I'm looking internally to myself. Now, the more that happens, the more I can't see what it's like for you. And so it creates a relationship problem because we're not building this relationship together. There's a secret that's often hidden with addiction. So my belief, addiction and intimacy can't coexist. The other uh, side of this coin is that intimacy actually aids in the addiction recovery. As individuals, and if you really watch people in recovery, they're actually very attractive people because they are being more open, more honest. And if you look at the word intimacy, it is into me see. In other words, I'm letting you into my world so you can see me. That's how intimacy helps in addiction recovery because individuals who are working towards intimacy absolutely will fight against the addiction and they will have greater strength to do so. So intimacy can come in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but individuals have talked with me, well, what if my spouse can't be there right now because I've hurt her or him so deeply? If that's the case, then you begin to form better bonds or deeper bonds with 12-step groups, with religious leaders, with a sponsor. People in recovery realize that they need deep relationships. Now, intimacy actually heals addiction. I believe we are social beings and we long for social connection. As a consequence, when we are not connecting, it's really hard to heal an addiction. Lonely people, if you look at the research, lonely people are way more inclined to engage in addictive habits and behaviors. So that's kind of the introduction to why I believe that addiction prevents intimacy. Very rarely do I see addiction and intimacy coexist. The only exception that I've ever found with that, it shows that smoking creates more stress. And so I'm not absolutely sure that there is a single addiction where you can develop deep intimacy with. If you have an answer to that that's a counter to mine, I would love to hear your perspective. I believe that addiction prevents intimacy. All right, now I'm going to move on to uh, what is called the partner sexuality assessment. And the reason why I bring this up, uh, again, this is Dr. Uh, Stephanie Carnes, is we have to start asking the question, what, what's actually going on in the bedroom of individuals who discover their partner's sexuality or their sexual misbehaviors, that's pornography or sexually acting out in another way. So here are a few questions that uh, Dr. Stephanie Carnes brings up. And there's different categories, and I'll discuss them. One, I will never be able to feel as sexually comfortable as I did before learning of the addiction. This is when the addiction has been in secrecy. Number two, I've been profoundly traumatized by this addiction. Three, I will never be able to trust anyone again. Four, I feel so emotionally distant from the addict that it is hard to be physically close. Now, when we start to look at the answers 
to these questions. Say, for example, go to number seven. I have lost respect for the addict. Number 10, I doubt that I will ever be able to forgive the addict. We start to get a feel of how that discovery is influencing the relationship. Again, we're looking at how the bigger picture influences the relationship, intimacy. And what she discovered is that there's a breakdown, and she specifically looks at these 10 areas, what she calls, uh, they're called subscales of the survey. Now, feelings of victimization, intimacy impairment, shame, what she refers to as sexual anorexia or aversion to sex, sexual dysfunction, body image issues, obligatory sex, compulsive sex, fear and anger. Those are the 10 primary categories. Now, what she describes in this is individuals who take this survey, and it's the partner sexual survey, when people take it, they really get a feel for what it's doing to them individually when they discover that their partner has been involved in pornography or sexually acting out. Now, let me show you a couple of the subscales to help explain this. This is what she refers to as intimacy impairment. And if you look through these questions, I feel so emotionally distant from the addict that it is hard to be physically close. Now, these are professionally written questions that address the nature of what's happening to the sexual relationship and the thoughts of the partner who is not the sexual addict but is dealing with their partner's behavior. Number three, trust in our relationship is destroyed. Number five, I no longer share my sexual desires with the addict. One of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later is that those sexual desires, while they still may be present, they're being focused on the fear that is created by the partner, the sexual addict's behavior. And number seven, I now find the addict repulsive. Now, as a clinician, I have seen this one many times. I believe as human beings, we are intimate beings. We long for human intimacy, including physical intimacy. But in this intimacy impairment, the fear, the pain that is created by the secretive behaviors have created a disconnect or a divide from the intimacy that is possible in the relationship. Now, conversely, when individuals turn towards intimacy and two people are turned toward each other, these things can change, and they can change actually rapidly when you have two people working on it. One, the individual who is the addict working on his recovery or her recovery, and the female or male working on the pain that the misbehavior is created. Now, let's go to the next one. This is the shame skill, and what many people don't realize is that shame is not just in the addict themselves, but it's also in the partner. Shame. I feel like the addict is the one who would, the only one who would want to be with me sexually or sexually be with me. I feel as though I am not worthy of fidelity. Listen to the internal dialogue here. I must not be a good lover since the addict went outside of the relationship. Number four, there's something wrong with me sexually, and I am sure that I was partly to blame for the addict's sexual acting out. These are internalized shame-based responses. And when that is present, then it's this partner's sexual behavior is now being internalized by the individual who is struggling how to make sense of what the partner has done. So shame, it's very instances they, they have these types of thoughts. So that is shame. And now we look at sexual anorexia or aversion. Now, I have completely shut down sexually. I no longer feel aroused when physically close to the addict. I don't want the addict to touch me. I often make excuses to avoid sex. For example, I'm too tired and I don't like to be naked in front of the addict. In all of these circumstances, what initially when this couple got together, there was probably a, a higher sexual compatibility, a stronger similar desires for sexual behaviors. And now as a result of the addictive habit or behaviors that were hidden, something has changed in this relationship. And the individual who was once sexual now has what they refer to as sexual anorexia, depriving oneself of their own sexuality. Again, I believe that we are human beings who have sexual desires and we have sex, our sexuality needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, what happens here is I shut down completely and it goes hand in hand with a physiological response. 
think about it. I don't want the addict to touch me. I've had some people tell me, I just can't, I feel almost repulsed when they come close to me. Now, that repulsion is generally a fear of being hurt, a fear of being in pain because of their partner's behavior. That is creating a, a sense of stress internally because as human beings, we naturally long to be close to people in a safe environment. But because it no longer feels safe, there is a distancing from one from another. There is a disconnect. And so the sexual anorexia takes over, and what used to be a normal, natural sexual response is now a fear-based sexual response. In other words, what does this mean? What does this touch mean? You've been looking at pornography or sexually acting out. Why do you want to be sexual with me now? I'm uncomfortable with how I look around you because I can't compete with the images that you're viewing. Now, I'm going to take a pause right here, and I just want you to think about what, I'm just, what I've just said. Our society really struggles to accept that hidden sexual behaviors, they don't really look at it as a abnormality. They just believe as a society that pornography is just a part of our culture. And I have personally written some articles on how it influences the intimacy in relationships. And I've been attacked quite uh, heavily because people firmly believe that sexual intimacy should not be influenced by pornography. In fact, there was a recent article that actually suggested that pornography enhances relationships. Now, I don't know what population they came up with, but that has clearly not been my experience, and I'm going to show you why in just a second. So, we think about this, we start to realize that intimacy and sexual addiction are not coexisting. Now, here are some of the additional issues, body image issues. I feel insecure about my body. I wonder how I compare sexually to other women or men. I compare my body to others and feel inferior. I have, uh, in particular, women and men who have said, I can't go out in public. I feel like I'm being compared. When we're sexual together, I feel like my body isn't attractive enough. That's why they went out of the relationship. And finally, I wish I could change my body. These are body image issues that are sometimes created as a result of a partner's sexual addiction. All right, now, let me give you an overview here. Uh, this overview is uh, really comes from a survey that I did through Psychology Today. I blogged on there. And when I was blogging on there, I asked the question, uh, what statement best describes your sexual relationship before pornography became a part of your relationship. In other words, I discovered my partner's behavior. Now, this is both men and women. This is a survey of almost 1,700 people. And you'll notice that over 500 of them, 500 of them, maybe 550, I was satisfied with our sexual relationship. Now, the blue, my partner wanted sex more than I did. That's almost 200. And about 220 said, I wanted sex more than my partner did. So that's what it was like before pornography became a part of the relationship. Again, this is a national sample, actually probably a worldwide sample that came uh, and took the survey through my Psychology Today blog. Now, the question I then followed up was, okay, before you discovered your partner was involved in pornography or you started using porn in your relationship, how often were you sexually intimate? So this is before the porn or before sexually acting out. and True to national standards, most, about 160 were having it daily. Uh, one time a week was almost 175. And then we just gradually work our way down. So this is, in particular, this is the women in, and individuals who caught their partner or discovered their partner was involved with pornography. Now here's the question, what happened to the sexual relationship? And here's what I want to show you. This is absolutely fascinating and, and sad, but look what happens. Now, now that you've discovered your partner's, involve, your partner's involvement in porn, or uh, they've been, uh, sorry, this is just in the way, or you have been using porn in your relationship, how frequently do you have sex now? Now, notice what happened. I'm, again, I'm going to go back and I'm gonna do, going to do a comparison so you can see these scales again. 200 and roughly 225 people stopped having sex. Not quite 225, but they stopped having sex altogether. And look at the one time a week, every two weeks, once a month, three to four times a year, 
Now let's go back up again. Uh, maybe I will go up again if my computer will let me. Mm, I apologize, my computer is stuck right here for a second. There we go. Okay, so now we look at this again one more time. All right, so this is this is before you discovered it, and now this is after. Can you see the difference? Again, remember who this population is. These are people who discovered their partner's involvement in pornography. So I asked the question, what is happening in the bedroom as a result of a secret sexual behavior outside of the marital understanding or expectations of one another? One more time, just, just so you can get a feel for it. Significant drop. I mean, seriously, if you look at that, that those two pictures or graphs tell an incredible story of what's happening in the bedroom as a result of sexual um, behaviors outside of the relationship. Now, here's uh, the, the follow-up to that. I asked the individual who was dealing with pornography or uh, whether they believed it was a problem or not. Again, this is these are people, some of them do not believe that pornography is a problem. Here's their story. Which statement best describes your sexual relationship before pornography became a part of your relationship? I find this very interesting that the majority of them, however, again, this is a smaller sample. This is about 350 individuals, but 140 of them, I mean, the, the, still the most of them, they were satisfied. So anyone who argues that they were not having good sex in the bedroom, uh, that does not parallel the research here. My partner wanted sex more than I did. That was about 40 people. And I wanted sex more than my partner did. Now, that was 125 people, roughly. So if you look at this graph, you come to realize it's not necessarily they're turning to pornography because there was something wrong in the bedroom. There's something else going on. I think that's very indicative of, of what our culture is doing and, and the power that pornography can have over individuals' lives. Now, let's look at what happens in the bedroom. Before pornography became a part of your relationship or your partner discovered you were involved, how often were you sexually intimate? Again, this, this almost parallels what we saw in the other sample of those who were influenced. Right? That's what we were seeing right there. Absolutely fascinating. Now, what happens uh, once the discovery or the secret comes out? And notice, it hardly changes. Um, we, we actually see that there is a slight drop. Some people stopped having sex, but still the majority of them are still having sex two to three times a week. So there's in some relationships, where the, it's not necessarily influencing uh, the, in this situation, I'm going to generalize for a second, the male. If the male has been the one who's been uh, looking at pornography, it's not, they're not reporting a significant change. So let me show you the, those graphs one more time just so you can see them. You can see that you know we stopped having sex. But there's maybe a few, but now if we watch, that's that's probably the biggest category that increases, right? We go from two through two to three times a week, maybe one time a week, and those get a little bit more. But daily goes down from just uh, right now. It's uh, if they've discovered it, it's just under 40. Before it was up about 50. So not a significant change, not anything like the partner's response, but still it's significant enough that we have to say, what is happening here? What is wanting to be close? So I'm now going to invite you to take a poll, and I'm going to ask you to share uh, the, your answer to this question. And I'm going to launch this poll. I invite you to take this. Please answer it. And I'm going to give you about one minute to share your answer with us. All right, about 20 more seconds.
All right, we're going to close the poll. Thank you. And it appears that 83% said they strongly agreed that pornography has influenced their sexual relationship. 10% agree, and 7% neither agree nor disagree. All right, so we're going to close that poll. And basically, almost everybody is saying that pornography has influenced this, their sexual relationship, uh, sexual intimacy in their relationship. All right, so that, that's one. Now, um, if we look at this, you're not a lot different than the rest of the population. Uh, in fact, it's quite normal. What's happening in the bedroom, this is actually from a second survey that I did, and this one has about 900 participants. So again, my sample sizes are not small. These are real-life people, real-life stories. And I asked this question, uh, the same question, to individuals. These are men or women who are struggling with the addiction and who are looking for help. In other words, they're looking for resources online to help them. And so that's this population. So I would just lay the foundation. So the same question, what was the sexual frequency in which you and your partner would be sexually intimate before the discovery of your involvement in pornography or other sexual behaviors? So you'll see on the left hand uh, chart, there are 5%, uh, basically 6% were daily, four to five times a week was about 11%, two to three times a week, 28%, once a week, 20%. So if you really look at it, uh, this is what was going on before the discovery or of a partner's involvement in pornography. Now if we go over to the left column, you're going to see something very interesting. You're going to see, these are men, again, or women who are reporting their own addictions. This is what happened now. So we literally look, go from, uh, if you go start at the bottom, 10% have now stopped having sex and we work our way back up and every every category starts going down. We go from five, almost 6% daily to almost 3%, so cutting it in half from 60 to 30. Four to five times a week, 121 people said that, dropped down to 68 people a week that are now having sex four to five times a week. Now, again, I just want you to think about these numbers. On average, before pornography, was discovered 121 of these uh, 900 participants were having sex four to five times a week. Now that it's been discovered, it's down to 68 people. Well, 78, actually that's couples. So 78, 88, 98, 108, we're talking over 50 people have literally, it, it's less frequent. Now, we continue working our way down and you consistently see everything moving down. That's what's happening in the bedroom. Now, as a society, how are we responding to this? What is happening to intimacy in the bedroom as a result of pornography? And do couples know how to talk about it? As a professional clinician, one of my deepest concerns is that we aren't helping couples reconnect in the recovery process. And the thing that's really being injured is the sexual intimacy and the overall intimacy in the relationship. So these are sample sizes that are big enough. These are people who are really in pain, who are struggling with the addiction, or their spouse or partner who is dealing with that. This is the challenge that we're facing, addiction or intimacy. Now, a couple of other things. Uh, let me see if I can get this to scroll down. There we go. This is a concept that I teach as a rebuilding tool, uh, but all getting sexual uh, behaviors from them. Psychological intimacy, by definition, it includes four components. Trust, honesty, loyalty, and commitment. The left column there. When you take any of those out, you get denial. If honesty is broken, they begin to question everything. Loyalty feels like you're being unfaithful and a commitment to the question they often ask, are you committed to me? Should I commit to you? Psychological intimacy is a, is a component where the brain relaxes if it's present. If I know I can trust you, if I know you are being honest with me, if I know you're being loyal to me, and I know you are committed, then I can do about anything. But if psychological intimacy is not present, intimacy does not occur. In fact, psychological intimacy, in my opinion, is one of the core foundations of a deep intimate bond. So one of the damaging reasons or damaging 
reasons for pornography to not be a part of the relationship, not be a part of our lives, is that it destroys the psychological intimacy. It literally makes people question, what are you doing? Are you being honest with me? Are you telling me the truth? When psychological intimacy is rebuilt, trust increases. In fact, we have a subsequent webinar series that I'm actually doing on how to help couples rebuild the trust based upon this concept of psychological intimacy. It's a four-week process where I talk with couples about how to resustain or how to sustain and rebuild the trust in the relationship. Uh, if you have interest in uh, participating in that, uh, you can contact us here at Edo Recovery. And it's really my goal there is to give couples a language to rebuild the psychological intimacy. This is for couples who are working towards a deeper bond and have been through some of the challenges that were created by the betrayal trust breach. So psychological intimacy, I want you to consider that. Now I'm going to ask you a quick poll question. Now that we've discussed psychological intimacy, I'm going to ask you to take this poll and psychological intimacy, here's the question, psychological intimacy is still present in our relationship even though my partner struggles with porn. I'm going to actually launch that poll right now and invite you to take it. And we'll go for one minute. About 10 seconds. All right, I'm going to now close the poll. The poll has been closed, and it looks like, uh, if we look at this, uh, some people feel like 13% still feel like they have psychological intimacy. Uh, that strongly agree, and 13% agree. 19% neither agree nor disagree. 25% disagree and 31% uh, dis, uh, strongly disagree, which means that about 56%, well over half of you, feel like psychological intimacy has been hurt or damaged as a result of your partner's pornography or sexual misbehaviors. Now, that's just a, uh, just a sample just to get you guys feeling what this is like. But the concept, think about it. Psychological intimacy actually is hurt in every intimate relationship we have, we long for the core components of psychological intimacy. We want to know our partner's committed. We want to know that they're loyal. We want to know that they're being honest and truthful with us. In fact, I have had people say to me, if my partner would even just tell me, hey, I slipped up today, I had a relapse, if they would tell me those things, it would actually help me understand that they're being trying and that they are now being more honest with me. Psychological intimacy, when it's present, we can develop a deeper intimate bond. And when it's not, every aspect of intimacy is limited. General, the solution, if you're struggling with the addiction yourself or your spouse is struggling with addiction, I invite you to ask this question. Am I modeling human intimacy? This is a self-evaluation question. The reason why I ask individuals and couples this question is because if we are intimate beings, and I firmly believe that each of us long for intimacy, the question is, are we modeling what we long for? Am I being a person who shows others how to love? If we're going to heal our society and our culture, we need to learn how to be better at human intimacy. So here's a quote that I absolutely love related to this. It is a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh who said this, if our hearts are big, we can be like the river. When our hearts are small, our understanding and compassion are limited and we suffer. 
we can't accept or tolerate others and their shortcomings, and we demand that they change. But when our hearts expand, the same things don't make us suffer anymore. We have a lot of understanding and compassion and can embrace others. We accept others as they are, and then they have a chance to transform. The concept here is that whether we're struggling with addiction or we ourselves have a fear or a pain associated with our partner's addiction, our challenge is to humanize each other. In other words, we need to see each other as humans and not dehumanize one another. We need to see each other. This is a hard thing and it is very challenging, especially when trust has been breached and broken. But human intimacy, it is a powerful healer. Now, my final quote, Thich Nhat Hanh said, all of us need love and all of us need to love. I believe that we in our heart of hearts are intimate beings who long for human connection. When we give love and create love, we feel more peace. That is a solution away from addiction and fear and pain. Now, as I close, a couple of things. If you are a spouse <clears throat> who has struggled with your partner's sexual addiction or pornography addiction, we have a free class for women that we offer through Ado Recovery. You can find out that at adorecovery.com. We also have our upcoming webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on this human intimacy topic where I talk about how to help couples rebuild the trust that has been hurt. You can also learn more uh, about that in our upcoming, uh, at, at our webinar, and uh, you can email me at this uh, page if you have interest in attending that. I want to uh, thank you for participating today, and I'm going to open it up if you have questions. Um, I would like to open it up if any of you have questions that you would like me to address. And I see a question here. Um, let me just see if I can uh, pull that up. It's going to take me just one second. If you'll be patient with me, I will try to answer these questions. All right, I'm, I apologize. It's still trying to get it. All right, here's a question. What are the signs that the addict is being honest and willing to recover? A, a very good question. Uh, some of the specific signs that I've seen over time is, first of all, there generally is, they begin to be open and they begin to have no more, less secrets, no secrets. In fact, uh, the research shows that when individuals have enough structure, um, there's not enough structure there are tend to be relapses. So when individuals are in the recovery process, secrets and structure are very helpful in knowing that they're making uh, progress towards the recovery. Uh, let's see, next question. It's, it's still very hard for me to get all of these questions and I'm not sure why they're not showing up. All right, next question. Um, Somebody, somebody, great, great point. They said you have a sample bias, um, and the truth is, is the sample that I have just gone over uh, comes from people all over the world who are looking on this topic, and there certainly is a sample bias with people who are seeking help. Does this fit with the general population? Generally, not. This fits with people who are seeking help, who are looking for help, and who are getting online looking for extra support. So, absolutely. Uh, 
there are there, there's no question that this is a sample bias but these are people who are typically I'm going to see in my office and I, my experience is that when I do this presentation most of the people relate very well with the things that we've talked about but absolutely would this fit with general population who don't think that pornography is a problem absolutely not these are people who are in pain related to this so that's a that's a very good point all right uh, other questions My husband had addiction before we were married and suffered uh, with it for years. How does that affect your research on intimacy? You know, that's a great question. My experience is this. Most intimacy problems actually began in early childhood. And the reason why it started in childhood is because either A, their parents were, and the research shows that people struggling with sexual addiction typically come from homes where they had parents who were disengaged or not really involved in their lives and or they were controlling and if you come from that kind of a home there's a whatever for whatever reason a greater tendency to turn toward addictive habits so uh, that is just a way for you to, to look at that part of it so early on in life there generally have not been deeper attachment bonds now that's not always true but when individuals get trapped in an addiction when they get trapped in the addiction itself they typically struggle to create intimate relationships and so that it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy people don't see me for who I am I firmly believe that anybody addicted in this does not want this addiction they do not want hypersexual behavior they simply don't but many times they don't know how to get out of it as a result it influences their self-worth their self-confidence and as a whole they struggle to be confident because any addiction generally makes people more stressed, more anxious, more depressed. And that's across the board. Smoking, alcohol, addiction creates more stress than answers that it creates or problems that it creates. Addiction creates many problems. So many times, uh, in fact, very many times, people who get married, if they're dealing with pornography uh, in their marriage, it, it was long before they were married. And that's not always the case, but in the majority of the cases that I'm familiar with, pornography was present before marriage occurred. And so that can influence how they approach intimate relationships. Sometimes it's a fear of intimacy. Sometimes it's if you really knew what I was like. But more and more I'm seeing people who are now talking about it before marriage. And what happens is the typically in this situation, the women did not realize the severity of it or they, they just thought that marriage would make it better. And in both circumstances, unless it's continually worked through and worked on and discussed, it's not a problem that just simply disappears. Generally speaking, there is an effort that is required, as there is with all addictive habits. Now, some people are questioning whether this is an addiction. In fact, our recent, uh, our recent uh, newspaper article research uh, came out of New Mexico where a survey of multiple researchers researchers have uh, research projects have said that they're not they're not uh, comfortable calling pornography an addiction because there's not enough scientific evidence uh, the article actually stated that it's not addictive that is not what the article said the article basically said that the research to date has been flawed and that there has been one research uh, that actually showed what it does to the brain the truth about pornography and sexual addiction is still being discovered whether we call it an addiction or not we need to understand it's changing relationships, it changes our brains, and it is altering how we feel and think. That's how I look at it. All right, uh, are there, let me see if I can see any other questions. I feel like the better question, honest, the biggest gap in my intimacy, physically or psychologically, seems to be altered more depending on honesty. That has actually been my experience as well. What do you think the, the poll would be if we, if honesty was taken into the question I'm cur just curious if it has more to do with honesty or the actual physical acting out or both I think it's actually both the reason why is if uh, if, if I'm honest but I'm relapsing every day you're you're not going to want to feel close to me however if I'm being successful and I'm periodically having a slip or relapse that honesty has significant weight because I'm not hiding it a general rule of thumb that uh, many uh, individuals and couples are using is this if there is a, if there is a relapse uh, I they want to know within 24 hours and what that does is that can keeps accountability uh, in the forefront 
Now, that's what some groups are actually suggesting is a certain period of time if there has been a relapse. My preference is actually accountability before the relapse, and that is what a sponsor can be, and in some situations the spouse can be, but not always because sometimes it's too personal for the spouse. All right, uh, I have a couple of other questions that... Um, um, I, there's just so many questions. I apologize that I'm not going to be able to get to them all today. Um, here's a, my final question that I'll be able to address. How is it that so many women are unable to pick up on the intimacy problems, addiction problems during courtship? I'm sure my husband has had intimacy issues all his life, but I just didn't see it at all. He was charismatic and outgoing and made friends easily, but had no lasting friends. Well, that might be your answer right there. Um, there's the reason why I think people don't pick up on intimacy challenges is is this when we are dating in courtship we have the love blinders on uh, we have the hormone balance uh, where we're just literally uh, infatuated and so we often dismiss behaviors that are potential red flags and we dismiss them primarily because we really see the good in them and the truth is every addict has an incredible amount of potential for intimacy we all do. We all do. My plea with this webinar is that we begin to humanize each other. We see each other as humans, not as demons. We don't dehumanize one another. We humanize each other. We see each other. I love the part in the movie Avatar where the man who has uh, really befriended this community was ultimately part of the demise of the community because of his uh, not seeing the big picture. But he goes and he fights for them, and at one point he goes and gets the biggest, I don't know, you want to call it a dragon, and he comes down to this community that's just been devastated because their tree of life has been destroyed. And he comes to them after capturing the biggest dragon. He gets off it, and the, the female that has been helping him, and they've formed this relationship, she comes up to him, and she uses this word, these words, I see you. My hope in the recovery process and the intimacy creating is that we will see each other. I want to thank you for participating with us here at Ado Recovery. This has been Dr. Kevin Skinner, and I appreciate your attendance today. My hope is that we'll be better at understanding the challenges and facing them head on so we can create deeper intimate bonds, whether we're in the addiction ourselves or as our partner. May God bless you as you move forward. Again, this has been Dr. Kevin Skinner. If you want more information, uh, we have this website, adorecovery.com, where you can learn more about us. Thanks again.